chapter 6. So if you would turn with me this morning, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. Thank you. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. Today we're going to talk about fasting. We're going to talk about fasting on the day when the lines will be longer at a restaurant than any other day of the year. (laughs) It is true. (laughs) Because what do we do for mom? We don't want her to have to work on Mother's Day, cook lunch for everyone, so we'll go out and buy it. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now this is, this this discussion on fasting takes place uh, amongst a a greater discussion. The the greater discussion goes back to the beginning of chapter 6. And the beginning of chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You will notice that that there is very much a repetition inside of those first couple of verses and the passage that we just read. There's there's a repetition because what is taking place is, is he is saying that the thing that we do not want to do in front of others just for the sake of being seen is to practice our righteousness as a display for our own glory, but instead what we are doing is we are practicing our righteousness in public and in private for the glory of God. And then he gives us three examples. Our material giving, our prayer, and our fasting. But be clear that these are not the only examples that we need to consider. If at any point Alex got to the point where he was coming up and he was leading us into worship through song for the sake of having people look to him and say, look at Alex, isn't he a great musician? Then that act of worship would fall very much into this same practice. Do not do these things in front of people just to be seen. If you do, then your reward will be this. It will be that people will look to you and say, wow, that was good. But your Father, your Heavenly Father, will not reward that. The same is true for myself. If I come to a time where I stand up and I preach, not for the purpose of bringing God's word to the people, but instead I come and I preach for the purpose of having people say, wow, that was funny, or enlightening, or not boring. If at any point my focus in preaching comes to the point of your glory being given to me, and not your glory being given to a heavenly Father, then I am guilty of this same thing. These just happen to be three sort of general principles that Jesus uses to say, this sort of thing can happen. It can happen so that we would serve God and worship God in such a way that is not true worship of God, but instead turning the light to ourselves. And we do not do this when we give materially. We do not do this when we pray, and we do not do this when we are fasting. What is fasting? Isn't, isn't fasting very much this sort of mysterious other thing? It's something that, it, that appears so many times through the scripture, but, but inside of our own hearts, we look at fasting and we're like, well, I understand what it means to give. We just took up the offering. We do that together. I understand what it means to pray. We've done that multiple times together, and I do that every time right before I eat and right before I go to bed and, and maybe in my quiet time. And, and so I understand what it means to pray. I understand what it means to give, but fasting... If we were to take these three and put them together in in the things that we wrap our heads around well and those things that we don't always understand well, it it would be very similar to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? We, We look at the Father and we say, I can understand God the Father, I can understand Jesus is the Son, the Holy Spirit, 
uh, is it, sometimes a little more ambiguous, and I don't always know what to, to think or to do and with that. And, and fasting is the same way. It's this mystery thing. But it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a mystery to us. If you look at, at these, this little passage that we just read, it starts off, and when you fast, which assumes something. It assumes that we are a people who fast. That is spoken in the exact same lines as, and when you give, and when you pray. It is an expectation of God's people that we would be a people that fast. And he doesn't just say it once. He says, he begins verse 16, and when you fast, and then in verse 17, but when you fast. Assuming that we would. So what? first we're going to ask the question, what is fasting? And then we're going to talk about the question of, why don't we fast more? Answering the question of what is fasting, first I want to say what it's not. Fasting is not the pretty to your pleas, all right? You know, when, when a kid wants something, they, they ask for it and they say, please. My kids don't always. I'm sure yours do, right? They want something and they say, please, right? Please is the request. I'm, I'm in need of something and so I ask for it. But what if the kid really wants it? They add a pretty to the please, don't they? Pretty please. I'm not even sure what that means exactly. Uh, but we, we all know what it means. It, it's just this sort of way of amplifying my request. How do I make my request greater so that the person who I'm asking for understands that much more that this is something that I want or need, and, and this is a way of pleading. Fasting is not necessarily a way of pleading. It is not a way of adding a plus one to your prayer. That's not the purpose of it. It's not like we go to God and we say, hey, God, these are the things that I want or need, and he doesn't listen and so we say, okay, okay, I'm going to ask more loudly. I'm going to take it up another notch, and I'm going to do that by fasting. And so fasting just becomes a way to make our prayers more effective. That's not necessarily what fasting is. Fasting is an opportunity for us to practice humility in an, in an ultimate way. You remember last week, we walked through the Lord's Prayer. And in walking through the Lord's Prayer, rather than looking at the method or the mechanic of the way that the prayer is set up, that he's talking to us about asking for certain things, and this is the way we ask, we, we talked about how this is a mood. And when we come before him and we say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are coming to him at that point in a mood of humility, and we are saying to him, you are God above all, you are God above me, and you need to be worshipped and your name made holy by me and by all. Make your name holy. This is all about you. It is a mood of humility. And then in verse 10, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is a way of setting our hearts in humility and saying, this is not about what I want. I am going to bring to you those things in my life that are hurts and struggles, those things that I think need to be answered, but... Before I even do that, I need to set my heart in humility and say, these are the things that I am going to ask about, but your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because you are our heavenly Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Yes, we work. Yes, we have jobs that allow us to provide. Yes, we might even be in a place where we have not worried about our daily bread for quite a while, but we need to understand, too, that it is God who is our provider and that we are capable of doing these work and that we are, are capable of feeding our family without worrying about where our daily bread comes from is in and of itself a gift from God himself because he has provided us with the work and the health and those kinds of things that we need in order to be able to provide ourselves with the food that we need. And so it is, again, a humility, humbling ourselves before God to even ask for 
our daily bread. And then we humble ourselves to ask forgiveness of our sins, understanding that we cannot save ourselves. It is by grace, through faith, and the mercy of Christ Jesus that we are saved. And we need Him in that. And so we humble ourselves as we ask for forgiveness. And we humble ourselves to ask that we would not be led into to temptation, but we would be delivered from evil. Why do we ask this? We ask this out of humility because we recognize very clearly that no, we cannot save ourselves. And at the same time, we cannot save ourselves. We are weak to push ourselves into the future without falling back into sin that we have just been forgiven of. And we need him in all things. We need him in all things. And as we practice that humility in prayer, we, we do find an amplification of prayer in fasting. It's not an amplification to try that much harder to bend the will of God to our will. That is what it is not. Instead, it's an amplification to bend our will to the will of the Father. This is not an opportunity, if, if we take it the first way, the way, that we said that, the way that we said fasting is not, if we take it that way and we add it as the, the pretty to our pleas, then what we are essentially saying is, God, I have asked for a good thing and you don't seem yet to understand that, so I have to raise the volume a little bit and maybe then you will come to understand how right I am. And I'm willing to take extreme measures. This is why people do hunger strikes, right? They believe that they stand for a cause that is right, that nobody else seems to understand, particularly the powers that be do not understand. And so they go on a hunger strike to gain attention to their cause so that people, those who are in charge of whatever it might be, would see the amount of effort and the extreme that they have gone to to make their voice heard. And they would say, fine, I'll listen, you're right. Fasting is not a hunger strike. It is not about bending God's will to ours. It is not about making sure that God understands better what it is that we're trying to say. This is about enhancing our prayer. And if our prayer is a prayer of humility, if our prayer in every effort is the opportunity for us to say, God, I need you, I need you, I need you. I need you for the sustenance of my life. I need you for wisdom. I need you for grace and for mercy. I need you to forgive my sins. I need you to keep me from sin. In everything that I am, I need you. Then when we amplify our prayer with fasting, what we are doing is we are reminding ourselves, you need him. More than anything else, you need him. And this is not about causing him to better understand our will. This is about causing me to better understand his will. This is about intentionally bringing my flesh into a weak and broken state. So that I can remember that this is not by my hands. I have not come to where I am by my own work, but by his grace and mercy and the strength of his hand. And I will not continue by my own strength, but I will continue only by the grace and the mercy that he gives to me. And I need for that. I long, for, I long for him to come into my life in a more powerful way. He must increase and I must decrease. This is not a one-time event. This is a continual state of being before God. Because whosoever would have their life in the end will lose it. But whosoever will lose their lives for my sake and the gospel will live for eternity. Alex read for us from John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, 
Jesus makes it clear that, that there are so many voices in this world, people who have come before him, even, even we. Like, we are amongst that group of robbers. We are constantly trying to steal away from God his own glory and, and to come in and, and do life in our, in our own mindset, in our own way. And, and he tells us very clearly there in John chapter 10, there are those who have come before me. There are voices other than mine. Every one of them are seeking to kill to steal and to destroy. But I have come that you would have life and that you would have it abundantly. I wanna wanna keep hammering this nail because this is a paradigm shift. What What is a shift in paradigm? A shift in paradigm means the very foundations of everything that we believe, that root of all of our practices has to be turned. For too long, the church has come in in this way that says, well, we know what is good, and we are going to pray for what is good, and we are going to ask God, and if we are good enough, and if we work hard enough, and if we pray enough, God will bless that, and we will get those things that we have wanted. And if we're not careful, we're going to preach on what it means to pray and to fast, and we are going to walk out of here with the understanding, these things that I want and haven't yet received, maybe it's not for lack of prayer, maybe it's because I haven't been fasting with my prayer. And that would be a tragedy. That is not what we are coming here this morning to discuss. What we are coming here this morning to discuss is that there is this part inside of me. And I say me because I know this to be a fact, and I just am going to trust that the example of myself, I will be in good enough company that you will be able to relate to this in some way, but there is a part inside of me that is still convinced that Tim has something to offer. That I'm not so bad. that I can contribute to my own salvation, and that my ideas are right ideas. That I can protect my family. That I can lead a church. These things aren't true. I don't even have to look very far into my own heart or my own past to realize I'm human. This is my first time through this life. I don't have any experience to really build on. I've never done this before. I need help. And what better help to rest on than to say to the creator of all things, a God who spoke all of this into existence, The God who my sin rebels against and has isolated me from him, who would see that and see me in my condemned state and say, I love that guy and I'm going to change his outcome. I am going to make a way for our relationship to be reconciled. And that is the display of his love. Christ Jesus would die for my sin. What better person to rest myself in and to just say, I need help and I trust you after all that you have done, after all that you are, and after all that you have done on my behalf, I trust you. I trust you to make my decisions. I want you to transform the way that I think. And every time that I try to stand up in my own way and I try to say, I know what's best, I can do this, I can do this, Jesus, just come and tell me no. And remind me that I need you. And how does fasting contribute to this? A few weeks back we saw a a teaching on this through David Platt in Secret Church. And he said some things in there that I thought were just simply profound. He started listing, talking about why we don't fast. And why don't we fast? Because we like to eat, let's be honest. That's essentially it, but for vanity's sake and physical appearance, we will skip a meal. Because we're busy at work, and what we were doing at work was too important for us to stop our work, we will work through lunch. 
I hope that stabs you the same way it stabbed me. That in these instances, we will say to our bodies, I understand that you have this carnal, physical, inherent need, but right now there is more important work to be done. And you're going to have to wait while that which is most important is taken care of first. And then we talk about fasting. And when we talk about fasting for the sake of prayer and humbling ourselves, we say, that sounds hard. Who could do such a thing? It sounds foreign because it's not something that the church commonly practices. It sounds next level, right? Like there, there are those Christians who, who will come forward and they'll be like, I believe in Jesus and I want to live and give my life to him. And there are those, then there's the next level, those people who would actually go into the Sunday school and help out in Sunday school and teach and that kind of stuff. And, and then there's the next level, those people who would go so far as to fast. And, and to be honest, if we were going to be honest with ourselves, if we get into the point where we find out that someone is a, a believer to the point that they are practicing fasting, we might even, deep down inside, for no, no cognitive reason, just, just because, even be suspicious a little bit of this practice. Why is this person fasting? It's, it's bizarre to us. And you know how you fix that? First, we need to fix that by we need to recognize that it's not bizarre in Scripture. Jesus Christ himself, knowing that he was going into ministry, humbled himself by fasting in the wilderness. Jesus himself made use of the spiritual discipline of fasting to strengthen his flesh that he might go in ministry to the glory of God. If Jesus is going to set this example, who am I to say, I've got this. I don't need that. I'm ready as it is. We can't. How do we fix the idea that it's bizarre, that it's other, that it's not something that we're accustomed to? I'll tell you, this is an easy one to fix. You do it. You do it the first time and it's a little bit strange because you've never done it before. You do it a second time and you're a little bit familiar with it, but you're still not sure if you're doing it the right way. You do it a third time and it's something that you've done before. A fourth and a fifth time and it's what you do. The only way to get over that sort of spatial distance between us and fasting is to fast. On what occasions should we fast? Sometimes we, we need to fast when we find ourselves in, in sin that we are fallen into or the temptation that we are struggling with. Sometimes we just need to take a season and say, I have been trying to battle this sin on my own. I cannot do this. I need Jesus in a new way. And rather than having breakfast this morning, I'm just going to spend that time in prayer and saying, God, I know that my body needs food, but more than food, I need Jesus. More than lunch, I need my heart humbled before a living God. Because this is what matters most to me. God, you matter most to me. And all of the excuses that might come with weakening my body in this process, let them fall where they may. What I need is not strength in my flesh. What I need is strength in my spirit. And only you can provide that. Sometimes we fast because we have a particular something that we are preparing for. It can be something we're coming out of. It can be something that we're preparing for. I want to provide you with an opportunity for this. I I don't just want to stand up here and say you should fast and let you go and say that's good enough, but but I want to to talk to you about something. We as a church have, have been, this church has been through a lot. I understand that, and And things are really good right now. 
I've had people come to me and, and use all kinds of metaphors, like I, I feel like it's, it's raining in the desert, or, or I feel like spring has come and there's just this new life and this vibrancy inside of this body of Christ that is exciting. We are, we are bringing people into membership so quickly we can't even keep up with them, and we're going to have to just do it as a class and get that done. We, we have the seven or eight people waiting in line to be baptized. This is a wonderful thing. This is an exciting thing. I, I hope that this stirs your heart with joy. I hope that this not only arouses you, but I hope that it's something that the community comes to see. Not only that things are going well inside of here, but the overflow of what God is doing in our lives would pour into their lives. And that we would reach this community and they would recognize, if I need hope in Jesus Christ, I can find that at Memorial Baptist Church. But you know who else is going to be awakened by this is our enemy. The one who has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. And seeing this church developing a new heart, a new spirit, not, and not new as if it had never been here before, but in a, in a revived way, in a way that people are, are starting to see growth internally and externally, and, and the way that we are seeing this rise of joy, the enemy would love nothing more than to come underneath us and cut that joy out. This can happen in a number of ways. This can happen in individual failures that really struggle or cause a church to struggle, particularly among staff and elders. Pray for me. Pray for your staff and your elders. Satan would love nothing more than to cut down the momentum of a church by calling into question their leaders. Let me give you another opportunity that we have to find ourselves in this struggle. You look around you this morning, it's getting tight. That's a good thing. For decades, this church has been talking about what it means to renovate or build. There are decades worth of opinions and angst built up in that. To the point that sometimes we make, <laughs> I've not heard the room rumble in a sort of preaching. That, that's, a, that's Baptist version of jumping up and shouting amen. <laughs> to the point that we make, a, sometimes we make these side-handed jokes that may or may not be jokes. About how this has gone, how this will go. We have to open the door to those discussions again. And this is a fantastic opportunity for God, or for Satan, to take all of the momentum that God has built inside of us and to cause division in the church. We will not let that happen. And so this is what I want us to do as a church. On June the 1st, June the 1st is a Saturday. At 5.30 on Saturday, June the 1st, I want us to come together as a church. I members, non-members, if you find yourself associated with this church and the heart and the spirit of this church, I want you to come here on June the 1st, and we are going to open the scripture, we are going to sing, and we are going to pray together. We are not going to talk about wisdom for building projects. That's not our job yet. We're going to talk about unity in the church that brings glory to Christ, who is the head of the church. And we're going to pray that God would humble our hearts and draw us together, that we would fall in love with each other in a way that we have never known together, that no matter what our opinions come for ministry and building and all the things that come down the road, we are in this together, and we are searching for the heart of Christ, not only for ourselves, but for our brothers and our sisters, and that is who we are. And at the end of that service, we are going to declare a fast. And so from 5.30 on, we will declare a fast, and then on June the 2nd, we will have church as per usual, and at the end of that service, because it is the first Sunday of the month, we will break that fast together in communion. I think this is a beautiful opportunity for us to practice this discipline that has been for too long forsaken.
together as a church for the unity of the church, for the glory of Christ, and to end it with that ceremony that he has given us that is to declare our unity together under him. And then afterward, we will go downstairs and we will have a potluck. June the 1st and June the 2nd, we are going to do this together. And I think that this is a wonderful opportunity. The first question is going to be asked, is there going to be child care? <laughs> no, and intentionally not so. One of the ways for us to make sure the next generation doesn't find themselves where we are, asking the question, what is fasting? What does it mean for a church to come together and to pray for unity and to humble themselves physically and spiritually before their God is to let them sit and watch and make noise while we are doing that very thing. And maybe, maybe we will raise up a generation that 20 years from now will be looking at the next things to happen for Memorial Baptist Church and they will say, well, of course we're going to have a unity service where we're going to come together and fast and pray. We've always done this and we are comfortable and we are familiar with the discipline of fasting and the joy that we find in humbling ourselves before a living God. Let's pray together. Father God, we've sung already this morning of how welcome your spirit is here. God, I want you to bend our hearts in such a way, God, that that would not just be words, but it would be truth, that we would be pleading for the Spirit of God in our church. God, that we would desire you so much that forsaking everything in this world, even those needs that you have given to us, that need for physical Sustainment through food would pale in comparison for our desire to be brought before you in humility and shaped to be like Christ. God, so that when we read John 10.10 10, and we hear that you have come, that we would have life more abundantly, God, we would no longer interpret that passage of abundance into the things that our flesh would find to be abundant, but we would find those things that our spirit longs for in abundance. Things that we in this current state can't even explain and that we don't even know to ask for. God, move in this church and move in our hearts for your glory's sake. God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.